Now, the election is over, and instead of a week-long question over who would win, it was a rather decisive victory by Donald Trump. So this morning, today, with conversations with friends and family, the question is now, one, at least one of the questions, what does this mean for the stock market. Chuck Zada, the managing partner and chief investment officer of the Armstrong Advisory Group, joins us now to help us understand this question exactly. So Chuck, what is happening? Is this a normal post-election reaction or is Wall Street happy with a Trump win? Well, in each of the last two elections, back in 2020 and 2016, we saw uh, significant rallies after the election, just once it was clear that there was a definitive winner, even though they were you know, two different parties that won those elections. So I do think some of this is simply the fact that, hey, there was so much nervousness and fear built up in markets that the fact that last night went off without any kind of significant political violence or anything like that, I think is something that's reassuring to markets. And now it's all about sorting through, hey, what kind of economic policies are you actually going to see implemented and how might those policies affect the economy and market going forward? Now, we know when we spoke to our viewers about balance of power, we know how important Congress is in terms of how much the president can get done. Right now, it looks like the Senate will stay red. The House still up for grabs at this time. If the president, if President elect Trump were to get a Republican sweep in Congress, how would that shape economic policy over these next four years? Well, I think it certainly allows him to accomplish, you know, some of the things that he might want to do. But it's also important to note that in 2017, when he came into office and had a Republican House and Republican Senate, the two main items that they wanted to pass in the first year of his term in office were tax reform and health care reform. What did they end up actually passing? It was just tax reform. When President Biden came into office in 2021, he too had a sweep. He had a Democrat House and a Democrat Senate, and there were two major priorities. The first was uh, some green energy spending. The second was going to be some changes to the tax code, largely in the form of some higher taxes and, and changes to tax brackets. He was not able to accomplish that, but could accomplish the green energy spending. So so I think even with majorities in both uh, chambers of Congress, it still is something where the relative uh, size of those majorities, particularly in the House, likely to be fairly narrow. And so that may limit some of what uh, they would be able to accomplish uh, in this term. So I think ultimately it's going to be something where there will be some priorities that Republicans are able uh, to accomplish based on the composition of Congress, but probably not all of them, simply because most major changes still require a 60 vote margin in the Senate. And that's not something that Republicans will have on their own. And this is helpful context for people for sure. Now, we know a big issue coming up next year is tax policy and the potential extension of the Tax Cuts and Job Act. This is a 2017 Republican tax law that's going to expire at the end of next year. And it's so big, some people may have even referred to heard it referred to as the Super Bowl of tax. Explain what's on the line here and why big business is so invested in this particular outcome. Yeah, so you have a number of different provisions that are set to expire at the end of next year. Tax rates for individuals and families are set to go back up to pre-2017 levels. Tax rates for businesses are set to go back up as well. And you even have some changes to the federal estate tax threshold that are set to go into effect. So it's really a, a pretty wide ranging set of changes that would happen. What I think is fairly likely at this point, given uh, what is the, the likely composition of Congress, is that you see this uh, th these changes instead extended out for another eight to 10 years as they're able to do through a process called reconciliation reconciliation that does not require a 60 vote uh, majority in the Senate. And that would be something where you could see these changes again extended out for an eight to 10 year period. There are limits as to how far out they can be extended through that process. But ultimately, I think that it's fairly likely that you move in that direction, potentially even seeing some changes to lower some provisions of the tax code even further. I know that one of them that's been floated is lowering the corporate tax rate an additional five or six percent. We'll see if that actually ends up making it into uh, a, a bill that ends up winding through Congress. Now, something else that we've heard a lot about 
so-called Trump trades leading up to the election. And today we're seeing those happening with surges in Trump media and Tesla and Bitcoin. So right now the markets are surging after a Trump win, but there could be problems on the horizon. Can you talk to us a little bit more about tariffs? President-elect Trump has proposed a 10% tariff on all U.S. imports, which many economists fear could reignite inflation, which the Federal Reserve has finally seemingly gotten under control. Yeah, and I think it remains to be seen whether or not you see this policy actually implemented. A number of Trump advisors today have been walking back some of the chatter regarding tariffs, so it's unclear exactly what's going to make it into effect. But the general principle behind tariffs is simple. If you are a company that's importing a good into the U.S., when it comes into that Port, that airport, wherever it might be, you have to pay that tariff uh, on that good. So if you are buying socks from uh, China that you're importing and it costs a dollar to make them and there's a 10 percent tariff, you actually have to pay a dollar and 10 for that because you're paying that extra 10 cents on top. What most companies then do, they pass that cost on in the form of a price increase to their end customers. And so that is a situation where it potentially does drive some additional inflation at a time where inflation is still the number one issue in most people's minds with regards to the economy. So I think we'll have to see how that all develops. The other thing to watch, aside from tariffs, uh, we do have something today where we're starting to see longer term interest rates rising as a result of the Trump victory. And so the 10 year U.S. Treasury has risen about 0.15 percent. And the impact that this has on the average person as of today, according to data from Mortgage News Daily, the average interest rate on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage being offered has risen by about 0.1 percent over the course of the last 24 hours. And so this is something that's pushing up interest rates on mortgages for families and could make it more expensive for them to borrow if that's sustained. And that's important to point out because that's something a lot of people have been talking about, talking about, especially just over this last election cycle, the accessibility to become a home buyer and those loans. But the Fed is actually meeting today to discuss interest rate cuts. What do you think is going to happen there? So the expectations... The Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, are about a 98% chance that the Fed goes through with a quarter percentage point cut on their short-term Fed funds rate tomorrow. Uh, a reminder, this cuts the short-term overnight lending rate to banks. It does not influence long-term rates. So even though the Fed started cutting interest rates in September, we've actually seen mortgage rates rise by almost 1% over that same time. And I think this is some of the disconnect that you have in terms of what can the Federal Reserve do and how do other interest rates in the market actually move. So just because the Fed is cutting interest rates doesn't mean that all of them move down in long step. In fact, you can see some different things based on what the market is actually interpreting as the longer term policy that the Fed might need to undertake. Now, just in these last 10 minutes or so, you and I have covered a lot of ground here. So what are you talking to your clients about today? Where do you start? Well, I think the big thing is there are still a lot of unanswered questions as to exactly which policies are going to be enacted uh, by a second Trump administration. So part of it is just telling them, look, we need to take a little bit of time and understand exactly what may or may not be implemented just because all candidates for any office talk about a number of different policies that they may want to implement, and they're often not able to actually implement all of those. We already talked about, uh, you know, the previous two presidential administrations not being able to implement all of their agenda. So I think it, it's important to realize, hey, just because all of these things have been mentioned across the, uh, across the course of a campaign, it's not a guarantee that they will make it into effect, actually. And so we have to look at what's actually possible to pass through Congress, what could potentially be done through executive order. Those are all things that we have to try to figure out. And that's something that takes a little bit of time as you're sorting through this transitional period. Chuck Zada from Armstrong Advisory Group, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you.